Hi, I'm Tito Beverage, founder and master distiller at Tito's Handmade Vodka. When I got into this business, I used to make flavored vodka infusions for my friends as gifts. When I started to make a go of it, the owner of a local liquor store showed me the dust on some flavored vodka bottles that sat on the shelves. He said, if you can make a straight vodka so smooth that you could drink it just by itself, then you'd really have something. So I did. And now all these years later, we still only make one flavor, vodka flavored vodka. 80 proof Tito's Handmade Vodka, distilled and bottled in Austin, Texas. Tito'sVodka.com. Welcome to Fantasy Hockey Life, presented by Fantrax. Here's Jack Hughes, and Hughes, score! Oh, the kid did it! Your source of information and analysis to help you win your fantasy hockey league. Barkov has a step, in on Stalock, Barkov shoots and scores! Here's your hosts, Jesse Sevier and Victor Nuno. Fantasy Hockey Life! It is Jesse Sevier from Fantrax. You just heard that. It is Victor Nuno from the Hockey Riders. You just heard that too. But what you haven't heard yet is all the wonderful takes we have for you today about the NHL teams that will lead to your fantasy success. So, Victor Nuno, how you doing this morning, buddy? Doing great. I'm still glowing in the aftermath of the NHL draft and... <laughs> Excited to kind of break it down. There were there were definitely the wild swings that I expected, and some real big lose, winners and losers, at least in our eyes. Of course, we don't know, but it's fun to it's fun to speculate on all that. That'll be next week's show. This week we gotta we gotta talk about these pesky penguins with uh, with with our buddy Davey B. So that's gonna be a fun one. I'm looking forward to it. That's right. Yeah, we have to stay we have to stay on discipline. Can't can't go flying off on the draft. And and don't worry. When you talk about the Penguins, you usually don't have to talk too much about the draft. Uh, although uh, I'm sure we'll have some takes later, but uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the the dig's gonna be a little bit shallow, folks. We're 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 barely gonna, you know, we're not we're not worried about even hitting water pipes, much less you know hitting into bedrock today. But uh, we're still gonna have fun. You can use your kids' sand toys for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, we, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to teasing Dave uh, pretty soon. And, and Dave's got a lot to be proud of, though, with this team. Obviously, everybody knows the Penguins, big time, big time NHL franchise. A couple of things that we should promote as big time, Victor, is our Discord. Uh, people are in our Discord, people are talking. One of the reasons is our Dynasty Hockey Leagues are close to drafting a few weeks away. We're still rounding up the last couple of stragglers. Hopefully, by the time people are listening to this late in the week, the last two holdouts will be located, will be found. Uh, little uh, Timmy will be found out of the well by Lassie, the Lassies of Fantasy Hockey, and uh, we will be able to move forward. But uh, there are two 18-team leagues. One of them will be uh, the Severe Storms Division. That will be my dynasty league. And then there's the El Nuno victor's dynasty league of 18 more teams and we've got two more to track down if you're listening to this you got till friday we have backups waiting and eager to take those last two spots if we can't run people down but either way we're going to be ready to go off we've got excited people in there and you find them in the discord we're talking all the time if you want to be in there it's absolutely free just hit one of us up or both of us up fantasyhockeylife at gmail.com we both see those if you hit one of us up on Twitter at Fan Hockey Life for me at Victor Nuno twelve for Victor, and we love responding to you. Or you could just ask questions, or you come in the Discord and ask questions, and everybody can talk to you. All good, however you want to do it. So, uh, so Victor, I don't know, man. Um, I'm I'm so excited to talk about these Penguins. Uh, what else is going on in your life right now? Are you still out there? Are you playing the summer disc golf of any sort? Oh yeah, always. You know me. I'm out there whenever I can. Um, it's it's pretty good weather, so just uh, trying to trying to hit up the hit up the links and uh, and getting ready for for new academic school as a, as a professor is always a big time when the new when the new year starts. So that's that's most of what my time is going to. But yeah, you know the kids are in in camps and um, being crazy, playing all day. So uh, it's exhausting just watching them. Yeah, that's uh wow. Well, it's a good thing there's nothing coming up like analyzing a whole NHL draft, uh, making rankings for fantasy hockey, <laughs> previewing all 32 teams and uh, you know, uh drafting pretty much round the clock for probably 
the next two months? You know, nothing big going on in your life that would distract yeah. you from work and kids and all those types of things. Yeah, nothing really. Just, uh, you know, that's that's uh, mild. <laughs> that's right. Uh, fantasy hockey life is a double life. We're all living a double life. One of them uh, trying to just keep it on the down low and uh, keep our hobby going. And the other, you know, those uh, responsible things that people are looking for. So we're going to take a brief break and we're going to come back in just a minute to talk with our buddy Dave Benton about the Penguins. Ready to go today, and we have a good friend of the show, Dave Benton of the Stream Scheme Podcast. How you doing this morning, Dave? I am absolutely perfect in tip-top shape, ready to rock and roll, number top five overall reoccurring guest of all time. Let's do it, baby. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Dave is the only guy I know who's ready to stream on July 25th of, uh, of the summer. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The enthusiasm is there. Well, y- you uh, you can still be enthusiastic about this Pittsburgh Penguins team, Dave. Uh, obviously, not hard to be a Pittsburgh Penguins fan in the modern era. Uh, and, uh, you know, this season was really no exception, especially during the regular season. They started with a quote-unquote slow 5-5-1 five, five, and one record. And then, no big deal, did the normal Penguins thing and went 32-11-2 from, from there on the way out. It just blew away everybody to tie to win that Eastern division. They scored the second most goals in the NHL. I always feel, you know, as I'm a Capitals fan, you're a Penguins fan, I kind of feel like these two teams have become mirror images, except that you have more cups. Uh, they're, they're kind of uh, this amazing regular season success. The core is getting older and older. There's a question of... When does the window close? And unfortunately, lately, it's been a quick exit in the playoffs for both franchises as well, uh, less than would be hoped for. The uh, the Penguins this year, fourth best power play, p- fairly normal for them. They always have an outstanding power play, but didn't get as many opportunities, only 25th in power play opportunities. Uh, their future is effectively mortgaged. Uh, <laughs> in another set of uh, questions on this episode, Victor and I are going to to go on and talk about a couple of prospects, but uh, the uh, the current team, they lost two players to the expansion draft, if you want to put it that way, because of trading Jared McCann. I have a crackpot theory about that, uh, which I can maybe get into, but, uh, but, you know, because I have unique takes on things involving the Toronto Maple Leafs and, uh, you know, nobody else ever talks about them. So I figure I can get those out first. Uh, but uh, let me just ask you, Dave, uh, what's the vibe around this team? Uh, What do you expect going forward? What are your general thoughts on the Pittsburgh Penguins? The vibe is very mixed, I would say, honestly. Um, It's kind of between the the question is whether the window is completely closed. Is the window closing or is it just shut entirely? And so basically, there's kind of a couple different camps in that regard. I am of the camp that the window with this roster is closed. They should not try to drag it out with, you know, try and essentially it kind of, I don't know if I'm skipping ahead here, but essentially it boils down to what they do with Malkin and Latang. And so if they're both in contract years right now, if they extend those guys, they are just holding on to something that isn't there. But if they maybe trade them for something, maybe a couple prospects, something like that, maybe actually get some first round picks for some for once in a while, then they have an opportunity to maybe try to extend the window with Crosby because Crosby's the one player that can really actually probably play until he's like 42 or something like that, just because he's in that good of shape. He's got that good a drive. Malkin, Latang, not so much. And that's their core. So there's, Obviously, the kind of vibes is that there's the fanboys that are going to always believe the players that are still saying that, yeah, we should have hung on to Flurry, even though at the time, Murray was just coming off two cup wins, and obviously, you weren't going to get rid of that. Now, they're sounding like they're right just because Flurry went on to still have this great career, but you're going to have those fanboys that are going to say that hold on to the stars no matter what happens, but I am of the opinion that... It's you saw what happened in the playoffs the last couple of years. It's not going to happen, but yeah, now they have this new regime. Maybe they might try and be a little bit more rough and tumble, you know, with Hexall and Burke, but 
I don't think it's going to happen. And until you see a serious shakeup with their core, I think you're going to see the same thing that happened in the playoffs year after year. I got to ask you about this protection list because I was very confused about, <clears throat> first of all, they, it seems like they traded McCann because they thought I don't want to lose him for nothing, which I get that it wasn't a great return, but I don't understand protecting. Uh, I, I know that Jeff Carter had a, had a great season and maybe you can believe in this Renaissance. I'm not sure that I do, but even if you did, I don't understand protecting Teddy Bluger or Mike Matheson over McCann, especially with that huge contract that Matheson has and being a little bit of a liability on the blue line and McCann just having this huge breakout season. It just seems like they got, not enough and and i don't even understand quite frankly why they expose him can you please explain this to me yeah i mean i didn't necessarily like it either um i I was a huge mccann fan you know yes we mccann but uh, the reason i understand why they did it is because the malkin injury and, and because they wanted to protect as many centers as they had possible so they want to protect carter they want to protect bluger so to me that kind of says that malkin's injury could be a lot more serious than anyone's letting on because all that we know about malkin's injury right now is that he's out i think i think they said he's not going to be ready until training camp and then they're going to kind of like reevaluate him at that time to me that means that he's probably going to be out for at least a month and it could be even longer than that and so they really wanted to make sure they kept carter and then it's that serious that they even wanted to keep bluger too and so to me that kind of speaks to the fact that malkin might be out long term and might might not even even play until next year a little bit of a hot take but that's kind of like what that says to me and so yeah i didn't like that protected list at all if it were up to me i would have protected i would have exposed bluger i mean really if they need to go sign a third line center. I mean, is it really that hard to replace Teddy Bluger? So I was upset about it, but I did understand it. And I do think it comes down to that Malkin injury as to why they did that. My crackpot theory, uh, since, since uh, I, I, I can't resist anymore, was that they knew that McCann was going, but they wanted uh, Tanev to be taken. We love Tanev in fantasy terms because of all the great stuff he does. And I'm sure, you know, Penguins fans probably love him too because of the toughness he brings to that team. I I totally get that. But when you look at that contract they signed him to, Hextall coming in is probably like, uh oh, we we <laughs> that that's not good. That's any kind of opportunity we have to get back and compete while we've got these uh superstars in, in you know at the end of their window. Uh, this is one of the contracts we need to move. Jeff Carter, pretty cost controlled. So they figured, but they knew McCann was the first who was going to be picked in that thing. So they said, you know what? We're going to do this thinking that they might take Tanev too. And they did. Uh, and they got something back for it and freed up a lot of salary room. But I don't know. Um, that That's that's just a theory. You think, does that have any credence? I'm springing that on you, Dave, um, from, you know, from my, my Illuminati uh, standpoint. But you think there's got anything to that? No, hundred percent. It has a very much credence, and they're totally trying. They were totally trying to lose that contract, and I'm surprised that Vancouver actually did it. When you look at their roster, that was actually one of the few players that they actually even like kind of spent money on. And so, uh, yes, they very much wanted to get rid of that contract. It was a very bad contract. I mean, yeah, like like you said, we love him as a fantasy player. Love him. The Penguins fan base is absolutely nuts over the guy. Like you know, you love that kind of guy that's going to get in there and mix it up. He's yelling at obscenities at people, stuff like that. Oh yeah. I meant Seattle. Uh, <laughs> Seattle spent the least amount of money. And so, yeah, you love Tanev as a player. You love him as fantasy. Uh, you hate the contract. Um, it was, I think he's signed until about 24, 25 ish for 3.5 million a year, which for like a fourth liner is just too much. And so, uh, at the end of the day, they were definitely trying to get rid of that contract. I was also surprised that they didn't try and get rid of uh, that Matheson contract as well. Um, him and Pedersen both have kind of bad contracts, but I guess the reasoning behind that is that at least Matheson kind of shows flashes at times. And so the hope is that maybe at some point he'll be able to just kind of tap into that all the time. Um, but at the end of the day, I understand the reasoning behind it, and I was very surprised that um, they actually took the bait there and took that contract because that was one of the few that they actually did. 
Yeah, well, we we are focused on next year's team, so that's probably all we're going to discuss in terms of McCann and Tanev. And <laughs> spoiler alert, we weren't going to talk about Matheson either from a fantasy perspective because he's not one of the most relevant. I think Pittsburgh would probably have to pay somebody to take that contract at this point. But uh, nonetheless, uh, the team is standing behind him, and and you never know. You never know. Uh, well, let's let's stop beating I, I around would, the bush, Dave. Could I interject there? Yeah. I, I mean, Matheson's the second most fantasy relevant defender on that team i mean you could make a case that maybe marino is in there but if, if i was like drafting strictly from like a penguins team i'd probably take more of a chance from matheson than i would marino in, this, really? in terms of second second penguins defender yeah because wow. he yeah wow. he has he has those flashes that's like all of a sudden he'll like start pushing up and act acting like a forward and make these crazy sweet passes and if, if if there were someone, if there was something to happen to Latang, yeah, it probably would be Marino that took the power play spot. But Matheson, just like on like a weekly basis, on like if I needed, if, if Penguins had a sweet schedule and I wanted to pick up a, a Penguin defender to kind of stream, essentially, um, yeah, I'd probably go Matheson because he's got the chance to kind of like just have a crazy good week and pick up like three or four points. Wow. All right. All right. Well, that's bonus content for people. Keep that. <laughs> keep that one in mind. Dave's watching this team. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's get to the real guy on this team. Let's talk about old Sidney Crosby, the superstar, the man who's going to keep selling those jerseys even if uh, Pittsburgh goes into rebuild mode. There's, there's just no question. And Dave is wearing a Crosby jersey, no doubt, right here on the podcast. Uh, so we know that he's informed. Another top ten finish in fantasy remains anchored in that first round to me. Uh, I, I always feel like you can get him at a value in auction leagues, and that has been true for years because it, it, to some people, even though he's arguably, uh, you know, has been the face of the NHL, still is one of the faces of the NHL, uh, and probably as ESPN takes things over and is is emphasizing the American product, he, he very well may be the face again for a while with McDavid playing up in Canada and Matthews. Uh, but at 33 years old, he led the team with 24 goals, 38 assists, 62 points in 55 games, playing a robust 2024 20, average time on ice. He's good for three shots and a hit per game. People don't think about the fact Crosby will throw some hits. He's not afraid of that. With third in the NHL, 676 faceoff wins. Absolute killer in that category if you happen to play it. It's it's almost boring to talk about Sid because we kind of know every year he's just going to be great. Uh, you know, I, I guess, what do I ask? Uh, is he going to have 90 points next year? What do you think about uh, where Crosby is headed on his aging curve? I think he's still going to be great. He's going to, like I kind of alluded to previously, I think he's going to age fantastic. I don't foresee any kind of slowdown in his game. In my opinion, I might be biased, but he's the best player in the NHL. Uh, until McDavid actually does something in the playoffs, I'm allowed to say that. And so, <laughs> and sorry, maybe Ovechkin maybe has a little bit of a case, but no. It's, Cros- it's- Cros- yeah, I think Crosby Crosby has more cups. I think Ovechkin's the best goal scorer in history, but Crosby yeah. is, you know, he's got it. He's the best player of the last decade. I'm, I'm willing to say that. Uh, Yeah, I think we can agree on that. And yeah, Crosby just has such a personal drive. Like he's not going to allow himself to kind of like, kind of just slowly drift off into the distance as maybe might we see someone like Malkin or something like that. But no, I, in terms of like 90 points. Yeah, I think it's absolutely every reason to expect that he's someone that whenever he, like there's so many names that are popping up like flavors of the week that are going to like make their way into like the end of that first round. If he's still there, like at the turn, like maybe like end first round, beginning a second round, you absolutely cannot go wrong with Sidney Crosby. He's going to do exactly what he did this past year. Again, this year, he still has Gensel. He still has Russ. He's still going to be on that top power play. I don't foresee any reason why he can't do exactly what he did last year again. All right. Well, the next guy we got to talk about is none other than Mr. Jake Gensel. Last season, when Gensel had his 90-point pace, I remember saying I could see him being a point-per-game plus guy moving forward. I think uh, I think Jesse was not on that same page. Uh, that bore out kind of in our rankings. I put him at 13, which I think was a pretty hot take that we argued about in the preseason. Jesse had him at 17, so naturally he fell right in between, which uh, is usually where a lot of things seem to happen, um, falling kind of right in between those uh, top and bottom. And he, he didn't shoot as much this last season, falling down to around two and a half shot 
pace for average. I know he ended last season, a uh, previous season with that, that shoulder injury uh, or upper, upper body injury. Not sure if that affected it, but he did have more hits, almost one per game. That's a, that's a pretty nice increase. And he had a huge uptick in power play points, a 26 power play point pace, uh, which is something that initially when he broke out, he was always just an even strength guy. So that's great to see that coming around. I don't think he was rocking any unreasonable percentages, and it seems like he's just going to be kind of mid-teens converter. Uh, he was 16.3% this season, which is right about exactly his career average. So it kind of seems like everything was in line, 83-point pace uh, in, in 56 games. Is this going to be what we should expect from Gensel moving forward around a point-per-game guy and a healthy diet of power play points? Uh, the, the easy answer is yes. Um, the harder answer is exactly, I guess, where you can get him. If you're taking him in like maybe like the middle of the second round, I would say that's a little bit high for him, admittedly. But if you can kind of snag him like in maybe like top to middle of the third round, I would say that's pretty good value at that point. And, and in, in general, to his shots onto like whether that was maybe related to his injury, I wouldn't necessarily say so. Um, I, I would say that that was just probably a matter of random <laughs> chance. I don't I, I don't really know uh, if there was an underlying reason to why he was shooting less. But I think in general, in terms of point per game, I don't want to say it's a lock. I would say maybe like 70 points would be about a lock for him. Uh, good power play points for sure. I, I think that's a little, little bit more reliable than his point per gameness. But yeah, I think he might be to the point where he's a little bit overrated um, because at the end of the day, um, he is a little line dependent. Like, I don't foresee any reason why he would ever fall off that Crosby line. You know, Crosby picks who he wants to play with. It's not the coach's decision. It's him. And I don't forever, <laughs> I don't ever see why Crosby would ever not want to play with him because uh, we saw that he was magnificent with Malkin as well. But then as soon as Crosby came back, Crosby was like, no. That's that's my winger. I'll I'll take him. And so I think as long as uh, Crosby's around and Crosby's healthy, that I'd say seventy points is the floor. Uh, point per game is a bit much. Like I would obviously his ceiling could probably be like maybe like a ninety point kind of guy, but I'd kind of put him a little bit under Crosby in terms of like what I would expect. Even though typically they should be right there, but I just don't feel comfortable saying for sure that he's a point per game kind of guy. Well, let's go also to Brian Rust coming into the season. I ranked him 77th, Victor 79th. He was actually the 41st best forward in the NHL. Tremendous year for Brian Rust. Wasn't quite what he was in 2019-20 where he was 56 points in 55 games, but 22 goals and 20 assists for 42 total points in 56 that's all of them, games, was very good last year. Interestingly, he went from being pinned to Evgeny Malkin to the prior year to being pinned with Crosby and Gensel this year. That line played the most minutes together of any line in the National Hockey League. Rust is burned into my memory for a couple of dominating performances against the Caps uh, that uh, that uh, were uh, very frustrating. It seems like Rust was always scoring goals against the Caps. He turned 29 during the playoffs down to one year on what I consider a ridiculously valuable $3.5 million contract. Uh, Brian Rust, next season, what are you expecting, Dave? Yeah, he's and he's, he was underrated last year, and he's still going to be underrated this year. It's kind of half. Like, I don't know uh, what people are looking for. Um, he's a shirt. Th- and like you mentioned, yeah, he was originally slated to kind of be on the Malkin line. And then uh, eventually Crosby was like, uh, nope, I'll take, I'll take him. He's, pl- he's playing with me. And <laughs> it's kind of funny that he has that kind of power. But yeah. Uh, and then as soon as that happened, it was just golden. A- and anyone who kind of drafted him, regardless of where you got him, he got tremendous value. I foresee kind of the same situation happening. And, you know, I love taking players in contract years. It, I absolutely love it. And that might begin a little bit ahead of myself here. But yeah, I I see no reason why he can't kind of uh, reproduce what he did last year. I think he's a sure thing, obviously, on the power play. And he's a sure thing on the top line. Worst case scenario, he gets knocked down to the second line, which I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But I don't, I don't know who would knock him off on the top line. I don't think he's a real fit with Kapanen kind of thing. 
And so I think he's a pretty good lock on the top line, top power play. And so I think he's got a, I think he's got like about a 60 point floor, which wherever you're getting him in your draft right now, that's incredible value. And there's always a little bit of a scenario in a contract year that maybe he could get traded. Uh, But in terms of the, what the Penguins are trying to do right now, I don't foresee that they're trying to win right now this year and they're not trying as at least as i can tell they're not trying to look to the future too much so i think wherever you can get brian rust i'd say even as early as the fourth round um that's might be a little bit of a reach at that point just because of all the other names that could be available right there but in terms of the value that he's going to provide i think he will produce wow tremendous uh definitely a guy to target then in an auction league where if he's definitely undervalued, you could uh, you could likely pay a couple couple bucks left uh, less and get something. The next guy to talk about, you've referenced him already a couple of times. He's the he's the one B uh, Evgeny Malkin on this team, and what a puzzling year! I ranked him 16th best forward coming into the year. Victor 22nd. He actually was the 181st. A disastrous year, at least as disastrous as it can be for somebody who was on a 70 point pace when he was out there. Eight goals, 20 assists in 33 total games. Started cold with only four points in nine January games. And sometimes that sets a perception for the whole season of what the guy's doing. I know there was like conditioning talk and and stuff like that. Uh, But then he missed a a long stretch, March through May, for a lower body injury, ultimately had knee surgery during the playoffs, uh, but in between had a very nice pace. Like I said, uh, you can't discount that when Malkin is healthy, Malkin's real, real good. He's down to only two shots per game versus over three for his career, which is a bit concerning to me when he was in there. I used to say that Malkin was uh, a first round talent when healthy and and he's frequently had these injury concerns over years, uh, but he missed time. And now I'm really starting to get scared off of uh, what to do with him in fantasy in the future. Dave, what do you make of of Evgeny Malkin at this point? Yeah, the, the injury is the most concerning to me. And like they, like I kind of mentioned earlier, I think they said they're gonna. He's not gonna be available for training camp. They're gonna reevaluate him at that point. And kind of like we talked about with the protection list about how insistent they were to protect those centers, even a center like Teddy Bluger, kind of says to me that he might be out for a while. So I think regardless of how good he is and he's such a name that he's gonna go earlier than he should pretty much in every single draft. Like. I think right now in the uh, keeping Carlson patron rankings, I think he went around like 40th um, overall, which at that point for someone who might be out until Christmas or maybe even next year, that's a bit much. And so that's not someone. And so that's about a couple months that he's going to be sitting on your bench. I would say if he falls, if, if you, if you have your draft late enough that you're able to hear the news that he's going to be out maybe for that kind of amount of time, I would let him drift maybe until like I wouldn't feel comfortable drafting him until maybe like the seventh round which there's no way unless like he's for sure unless news comes out that like actually says he is going to be out until like January or February there is no way that he's going to last that long and you're not going to get the value out of him when he if you do take him that high and yeah, like you said, when he's on the ice, when he's healthy, he's awesome. And yeah, he is in a contract year and I love contract years, which it pains me that I'm going to have to pass on him in these kind of situations, but I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze in this scenario. I would let someone else take that problem with Malkin in your fantasy drafts. Ooh, a little bit of a hot take there, but I like it. It makes sense. It makes sense. Um, so the next guy we got to talk about is Kasperi Kapanen. And Kapanen had a really quiet 62-point pace this season. And neither of us ranked us, and he ended up 200th in Fantrax standard category. So I guess that was correct. But still, um, pretty relevant season for the man who paced for 46 and 43 in his previous two seasons. So definitely a bit of an uptick there and and relevant in, in deeper leagues for sure. Uh, his time on ice was about the same, but his power play time on ice went up just a smidge. Uh, shooting percentage increased by five over his career average. And his his luck metrics of PDO and power play points percentage were well above his career norm. So, you know, is, is Kavanaugh going to regress hard? Is, is the bottom going to fall out here? And specifically, would you take the over and under on a 55-point pace? 
Ooh, that's a good over under. Um, well, <laughs> I would say under. Uh, just because um, he is kind of linked to the hip on Malkin, I think, in terms of his uh, production, because it's kind of good news, bad news. Good news, if Malkin is out, he probably does take more power play time. The bad news is his even strength is probably going to be uh, him, Jeff Carter, and Zucker, which is just kind of a hodgepodge of relatively fantasy names, but I'm not sure how actual production of they could be on a full-time basis so i am saying under i think if i had to guess i'd probably say right around 50 points uh but that is a good over or under is he's someone that maybe if you're in a league with someone who is a pittsburgh penguins fanboy might be willing to grab a little bit but to me uh he's kind of like right on the edge of being fantasy relevant because i always say for like a forward you know if you're under 50 points you're you're really not fantasy relevant as a forward. So to me, he's someone that I would keep on my watch list. Um, if he, if he maybe necessarily has a good week and he, or maybe if uh, you, news is out that Malkin will be out for a couple months, maybe he's worth a, a late round flyer uh, because if he does get hot on that power play, or maybe he does develop some chemistry with that second line. Um, I could see him maybe being hot at times, I don't think he's someone that if you do draft to expect to maybe necessarily be on your roster full time, or maybe if you draft him late, he starts performing quick. He's definitely someone that I would want to sell high on quick to get a little bit of a, someone who's a little bit more consistent along the way. But yeah, I would say right around 50 points for Kapanen sounds about right. Moving to the blue line. And it always starts for this franchise with Chris Letang. I ranked him 14th, trying to price in a potential injury victor. A little bit smarter. Put him at fifth. He was actually fourth. Vintage work from Mr. Latang with seven goals, 38 assists for 45 points in 55 games. That was third in the NHL among D. Also, he throws in two and a half shots, a block, one and a half hits per game. Tremendous stuff. We have our bash metric, which is blocks plus shots plus hits. He was the 24th ranked D man in the NHL. Uh, very good for him, especially for a guy with that many points. Uh, you you got to love seeing that type of a, a stat line. Only the second time in the last 10 years that Latang has missed fewer than 11 games. But weirdly, two of those three uh, years have been within, uh, those two years have come within the last three. In Roto, we roll the dice uh, in head to head. You always worry, just like with Malkin, because uh, could he be gone in your fantasy playoffs when you need him most? But he isn't going anywhere for the next year, unless, uh, like you say, uh, he is because of a rebuilding type effort. But uh, a $7.25 million contract, and if they did want him to go somewhere, they'd have to get him to waive that no move clause. So with Chris Letang, Dave, what are your scoring and your health expectations for him going forward? Yeah, like you mentioned, uh, he has actually been relatively healthy healthy recently. And I'm, I'm always of the opinion that never draft scared. Um, I don't believe in the whole Band-Aid boy theory. I, I believe that injuries are indeed random. And like, yeah, well, maybe someone like Malkin, who actually is injured right now, I'll take that into account. But saying that someone might become injured down the road, I'm not of that theory. So I am all in on Chris Letang this year. Uh, he's going to be he was amazing last year, contract year. I love it. And so if he is maybe a little bit dinged up, he's going to be that much more incentivized to you know get out there and, <laughs> and freaking play. And so I don't foresee any reason that he can't replicate what he did last year. I think he's going to be a top five D-man again. He's going to fall in drafts because of that Band-Aid, Band-Aid boy theory. And so you're going to get good value on him no matter where you get him i'd say anywhere from the fourth round on it's going to be incredible value i'd probably snag him right around there in like the fourth top of the fourth round because he is going to if if he gets to the end of fourth round i think he's going to be taken so i think Latang's going to have a great year i'm not worried about the injury history it's a contract year he's going to have be on that top power play no matter what i love him get him (laughs) Tremendous. Well, uh, moving on to the D-man who you said probably would only be your third favorite, but uh, Marino uh, is kind of the second power play D on this team, according to minutes right now. 
And of course, the second power play D-man is a closely monitored situation on this team. Just in case Latang is hurt, uh, it seems like we uh, every season have a, a short scramble to figure out uh, who's going to take over the role on that absolutely elite power play. Uh, by far the second most minutes on the power play among the D-men this year. Team clearly has confidence in him because they've got him for a team high six more years of contract to come. He's 24 years old. He's got more years ahead of him as a Penguin than anybody else, according to the current contracts. Played 20-44 average time on ice last year, so he's getting the minutes. Only his second season in the National Hockey League. After 26 in 56, uh, 26 points in 56 games, year one, he managed only three goals, 10 assists, and 13 total points in 52 games this year. Not great scoring, as, as you would hope. Uh, he manages only a shot, a block, and a hit per game. Not also elite for what you're looking for in the peripheral categories. As you said, maybe Matheson gets you a little bit more. But uh, an 18 IPP, <laughs> when he's on the ice and somebody scores, he gets a point 18% of the time, which is like, a, it's not, a, it's last on the team among anybody who got a point, I think. And frankly, uh, you know, it's got to be among the bottom few in the National Hockey League. He's got to get some some bounces at some point with a team like this. That seems ready to regress. Big flashing uh, sirens and red flags. Is Marino in the wings for this team's defensive scoring opportunities or a secondary scoring piece with poor peripherals? Yeah, I Marino is someone who's always very tempting. Yeah, because of the reasons that you mentioned. He gets heavy minutes and, and he's always uh, hit away from being on that top power play. But he, it's it's uncanny, like that he gets so few points <laughs> for being on the ice that much. He's such a disappointment. I think I picked them up on multiple occasions last year and he's still like, get you. It's like, how, what are you doing out there when you're on the ice for like 26 minutes? It, it's insane. But, and every once in a while, he will show a little bit of flashes of being a little bit offensive, cap- offensively capable, I suppose. But at the end of the day, he's someone that, is just going to be a big tease, essentially. He's not someone that I would necessarily have on my roster, and even just someone that I would pick up as like as a stream. Uh, he's someone that just never seems to be able to come around and actually produce. So I would keep him on my watch list. I would never draft him, but I would definitely uh, keep a close eye on him if Latang ever did go down, because as long as he... In, even if he got top power play minutes, I'm, I can't even really predict like what his like actual points would be because I don't even like he might be like a thirty point scorer if he got on the top power play. But is that someone you necessarily draft a uh, thirty point defender? I don't think so. Maybe like so. And even then, it would be like, well, okay, how long is he going to stay on the power play? Once Chris Latang coming back, so I would definitely pick him up if he did get on the top power play. But I would definitely flip him really quick. Um, and it's always possible that he does develop his offensive game and become someone that you might want to pick up on your roster. But at this point in time, uh, yeah, just ignore those big minutes uh, because I don't know how he's not able to produce more offensively, but he just never seems to be able to get on the score sheet when he really should. Definite disappointment. And we know our good buddy over at Keeping Carlson, Elon, was super excited about John Marino and uh, drafted him really high in, in our dynasty league and was a epic disappointment. So um, just, uh, yeah, keep it's, it's, it, 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 you, you make a good point though. Like he really should be getting more points and he just isn't. It's really kind of a head scratcher. But another guy that we definitely uh, have been, have been waiting to see and it's been really exciting is Pierre Olivier Joseph. Um, he has been one of the very few prospects of note that we have been looking forward to seeing in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, you know, he, he's, he finally showed up uh, last off season. Um, we cooled our jets on him a little bit after he, had, he seemed to have a bit of a rough transition to pro hockey uh, in the AHL. Um, Jesse took Rathbone over him in our player comparison. And I agreed with that um, this season, he raises AHL point totals to half point per game. That was nice and got some, uh, NHL time too. 16 games in stat showed us that he, he nearly doubled his net XG and improved his Corsi as well. His shots rose to two a game and got more than double the power play time on ice in his first, from his first AHL season. So he's getting the opportunity there. 
for the pens, he was kind of middle of the road and expected goals and Corsi percent per 60, um, which is good for, you know, a rookie, you know, not getting caved in is basically a win. Uh, I think, uh, as a rookie defender. So that, that was positive. Uh, it seemed like POJ is going to need a little bit, uh, power play time on ice in order to raise his point pace from 26 and get more than 1.7 shots a game. Do you think he can do that? And do you think he can get over a 35 point pace as, ne- as early as next season? I absolutely believe in P.O. Joseph. He's someone that I'm extremely confident about that he's going to be a penguin building block going forward on their blue line. But in terms of can he be over someone who's going to get you 35 points next year? No. Um, I think if he gets 30, that would be a very good year for him. And really it comes down to what they want to do with their defense. Are they going to continue to like – Tried out guys that like Cody CC out there, or are they going to give someone like P.O. Joseph a little bit more time to get ice, to get on ice rather? So I think at the end of the day, I, it's a little bit, I do believe in P.O. Joseph overall. I think he's going to be someone a little bit more down the line that you can see on the Penguins, especially if they get, a, get away from the tanks contract after this next year. You'll definitely see a lot more of him at then. But at this point, ne- just this next year, I would say that. 30 would be his ceiling um and because there's all i don't even know what his floor would necessarily would be his floor would be just negligible just because he's someone that they might be like well we still need you to kind of go back down and get some more time there rather than maybe we'd rather see you get heavy minutes in the minors rather than getting like 16 minutes of time on ice in the nhl so i would i do believe in him eventually in dynasty leagues i think he's someone that you definitely need to keep on your roster but in terms of someone like in a redraft uh, fantasy year next year, he's someone that you can maybe keep on your watch list, but I would probably avoid him. Into the crease, Dave. And let's start out with Tristan Jerry. Uh, into the season, I ranked him 16th, Victor 13th. We were all excited about some of these young guys coming up. Uh, Jerry, the 25-year-old, uh, plugged along and plugged along. Other guys fell under him, and he finished 11th. He had a poor goal saved above expected. Let's just throw that out. But he plays a lot, and that's what really elevates his overall score for fantasy. 39 games, that was sixth in the National Hockey League. And, by the way, uh, if we didn't mention, he plays for a real, real good team, <laughs> which meant third most wins in the NHL. 909 save percentage is is blah, but it doesn't kill you in fantasy. And he's on a decent contract from a real-life perspective, which is part of why he gets to still be there when Matt Murray is up earning big bucks and letting in big goals in Ottawa. Two more years of 3.5 per for Jerry is uh, not not so bad from a contract perspective. Do you think he could play closer to that 921 form uh, from the year before that ran Murray out of town? Or is he just going to be a replacement level goalie maybe, but on a really good team and, and therefore racking up good stats? The latter. Uh, replacement, level, re- replacement level goalie on a really good team, I think, is a very good way to put it. Um, obviously, anyone who saw their uh, Penguin series <laughs> in the playoffs know that <laughs> he was the reason why they lost, essentially. Just absolutely pooped the bed, uh, to put it lightly. And so... I think you're going to mainly see one A, one B, but with him in the Smith. But that is if they don't sign a veteran goalie. The common belief is, is that they got rid of McCann, they got rid of Tanev, and they're going to use that little bit of extra cap space to kind of maybe go after a veteran goaltender, in which case it would truly be a one A, one B. Right now, it's a little bit, I'd say probably a little bit. About 66% Jari, uh, 33% to Smith. But if they went out and actually got a veteran goaltender, I think you'd see a little bit more of an actual 50-50 split with the possibility that um, if if one of them gets hot, maybe they'll run with them. But if you're drafting Jari, duh, I, I, <laughs> I can't recommend it. I, I mean, maybe if you're in a Cats League, and you're kind of like, yeah, like you're kind of going after someone who strictly wants wins kind of thing. Even then, you're kind of saying, okay, if they only, let's say they play Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you're, you're probably only getting two starts, and you might only get one win, which you can easily get the same amount from like someone that you're picking up off, off the waiver wire to kind of get that kind of same level of results. You're not going to get a good save percentage out of them. 
if I had to guess, I would say, yeah, probably around like 905, 910 would probably be what I expect out of them. Even 910 might be a little bit nice at this point. But the common belief around Pittsburgh is that he kind of showed his true form in that the kind of flashes of brilliance that we've seen from him previously was just that flashes in the pan. And that's if you're going to rely on him long-term throughout the course of a season or even into the playoffs, that he's not going to be that person that's going to carry your team that he really does need at the very least that like one B kind of aspect to his game that he's not someone that's going to be like a Vasilevsky type workhorse and be able to get you like two or three wins in a week or something like that. So yeah, maybe if, yeah, he's definitely more of a cat's league than a points guy, I think. Yeah. Cause he'll get you the, the wins and I guess he'll get you to saves, but he's not someone that I would touch in any of my leagues. I'd let someone else deal with that problem. That's all well and good, but how good is Jari at disc golf? Because, you know, the backup goalie for <laughs> Pittsburgh is a professional disc golfer. I, I bet he shoots double bogeys on par three. <laughs> <laughs> He's good until the playoffs of the uh, the disc golf tournament. Uh, in, in uh, oh, burn. Uh, so Casey DeSmith, that's the other guy uh, in this crease. Uh, you talked about him as the 1B potentially. Three years older than uh, than Tristan. His goal saved above expected was far better. Uh, of course, the backup goal is always the most popular guy in town uh, on any team, right? Uh, his save percentage really wasn't that much better. Only 913. Not a huge swing between the two of them. He's got 20 games, and he has one more year on a cheap $1.25 million contract. He wasn't protected in the expansion draft. Uh, probably understandably, you're going you're gonna to protect, uh, protect your starter above DeSmith, and he was not taken. Does DeSmith have a chance? Uh, you, you talked about maybe they're going to sign a big goalie, but can you foresee a situation where DeSmith takes over the starting role for this team? 100%. Yeah, I'm a lot higher on DeSmith, especially for his value, than I am on Jari. And like you mentioned, he was unprotected in the expansion draft. And he was actually my pick. If I were the GM, I would have taken DeSmith like, on just a cheap one deal. I actually w- would have drafted a bunch of backup goalies and just held up, held the backup goalies ransom for the rest of the NHL and make me give me a bunch of like fourth and fifth round picks for him and stuff like that. But yeah, he's super cheap and he's, He's, he's a great backup goalie. He's not someone that you're going to necessarily rely on the whole year. And I guess probably maybe Jari is he's kind of like the same goalie as Jari. Like I, I think Jari would also be an excellent backup goalie. But in terms of like can't and can he get hot and like go on runs and absolutely carry the team? Absolutely. And he's someone that I would absolutely be terrified of if I was a Jari owner because all it takes for him to get a little bit hot. And obviously the new uh, ownership doesn't have any ties to him necessarily. So they don't have any reason why they would necessarily, I guess, other than the contract, maybe no, we're paying this guy more. We want him to start kind of thing, but they don't have any reason to like, if he's getting hot to not run with him even for the rest of the season. But I guess that's kind of like in any kind of situation where you kind of have a one, a one B if someone gets hot, um, kind of have a hard time like kind of leaving him as the B in, in this 1A, 1B scenario. But he's a the, – the, yeah, the problem is they're kind of the same goalie. They're both great backup goalies. I wouldn't necessarily like either one of them to be my full-time goalie, but either one of them at any point in time can get hot. And on a team like this that's going to pick up wins, he's definitely someone that you want to be watching with and you want to jump on early if you do see that he's kind of getting hot. Maybe I would say if you see DeSmith – at any point in the season get two starts in a row and like not like like you know if it's like a tuesday and a thursday like not like a scheduling reason why he's starting two in a row and not an injury reason why he's starting two in a row if you see that happen and he gets two wins puts up good performances you need to jump on that super quick because he might go on like a month run that could even potentially win you your season so yeah i love the smith I would hate him if I'm a Jari owner, but I would probably say the same thing if like the Smith was actually the starter, <laughs> Jari was the backup. So they're kind of the same guy. And yeah, I do kind of expect them to at least make a run at a veteran goaltender. So I'd kind of preface all of this goalie talk with that, that uh, 
it could kind of all go out the window depending on who they get. But I don't even know necessarily like who they would sign. That would make me feel like, <laughs> but that would make me kind of like change my opinion on them. So uh, there, I would definitely, sw- someone else is going to take Jari. Stay away from him. In terms of DeSmith, definitely watch him. Yeah, if you see him get those two starts in a row, pick him up because he might go on a run. Well, listeners, I can tell you right now, I knew that uh, that Dave's preferred strategy for the Kraken was back uh, draft a bunch of back goalies and then hold the rest of the league uh, hostage. And the reason I know, like maybe many of you do, is that I listened to Dave's Stream Scheme podcast, and he recently put out an episode with his uh, with his mock Seattle Kraken expansion draft, and I, I know that was uh, part of your talking points. Really tremendous uh, to get that off season uh, off season episode from you. And during the season, people need to be listening on uh, the frequent basis to hear uh, the streaming picks that Dave has coming up because those are uh, those are essential. Those are excellent for those of you playing in redraft leagues and trying to figure out the guys that you might want to take on an upcoming weekend. Um, Dave, you just do tremendous work with that. Is it? Good? Are we coming back in the fall? I, I don't want to pressure you or nothing, but are we going to get some more stream scheme in the fall? Hundred percent. Yeah, we had a great year last year. I think I went, I think overall, I tried to like my barometer for success each week. Uh, I pick 10 10 streamers each week and I always try to go at least 50%. Um, I choose five forwards, three defenders, um, and each of those are all less than 20% rostered in a Yahoo league. And so we're not picking some 